we are in the book of Acts. We are out on the day of Pentecost. We are finishing up the um, sermon that Peter preached. Just to be clear, uh, the book of Acts is not uh, given to us as a commandment to do things in a certain way. It is a history. So it is not so much commandments to us to do this. It is the pattern that God established for the church. Therefore, it is something for us to look at very carefully. When the church began, it didn't have deacons because it didn't need deacons. And uh, then, uh, and we'll be getting into it as God allows, uh, we'll see what the need was and what they decided to do about it. And the, the answer was, we need deacons. So uh, take care of that. Now we have a memory verse, and Angie tells me it's a hard one to get, keep in mind. So uh, Acts 2.36, let's all say it together and then we'll get who can say it out loud uh, by memory. Ready? Acts 2.36, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ, Master and Messiah. All right, you're on. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. No, no. Ethan? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think study yeah okay. <laughs> All right. Donna? No. <laughs> okay. um, but uh, you get to see this message to Israel, uh, who, as a nation, as a family tribe, uh, they had killed, crucified Christ. Uh, while the Romans nailed the nails, they were the ones that put him where it was. And um, now he says, Christ rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, and because he was there, he sent the Holy Spirit, which they saw the effects of it right then. These people with flames of fire appearing over their head. And... Um, I mean, you talk about getting on fire for the Lord. I mean, this was, this was literally the thing, you know. And, and then speaking in tongues, something that nobody had ever heard of before. And it wasn't gibberish. It was actual languages. There was somebody speaking Syrian and Egyptian and all these things. These people didn't learn these languages. They didn't know these languages. In fact, they didn't understand what they were saying. But they were given an impulse by the Holy Spirit that was filling them. And then they find out that what they're saying, which they don't know it, they can't understand it, what they're saying is actually being understood by people from these various areas. All right, let's look then at uh, point number three is the application. <clears throat> he has given the message, here's what happened. You ask, what does this mean? Here's what it means, the Jesus that you killed has risen and is ascended, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and has sent the Holy Spirit to continue his work in that special way that the Holy Spirit can do by entering into the hearts of people. So the application to this then is that we find there was an experience of conviction. Uh, when we say conviction, it means people were convinced of this for themselves, and they felt that they had been convicted of the crime of sin. So we see the internal response. The group now cries out. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Now to me, <clears throat> in English, pricked means ow. I wasn't careful with that needle, you know. But <clears throat> seems to be a stronger word in the Greek. A.T. Robertson says, the word means to pierce, which I guess that's what happens when you prick your thumb. To sting sharply, to stun, to smite. So uh, this is a, a bigger word. This is, this is not just that. It's when the needle goes through your thumb. I did that. I was using a sewing needle, 
and I was trying to push it through a piece of cardboard. The cardboard was tougher than my thumb, and so the eye of the needle went into my thumb, came out past my thumbnail. So I said, hmm, that's not good. <laughs> so I pulled it out so the narrow end came out, and then I put a band on it. But um, that's what was going on in their heart, you see. They were stricken. They were smitten. They were stunned in their heart. Then the external response, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? You can't leave us like this. We are guilty of doing evil to the man who ends up being the son of God and is sitting at the right hand of the father. I notice here that like the Philippian jailer who said, what must I do to be saved? They are asking, what religious right must I perform? See? What shall I do? Now, the answer to this is not, well, let me sit down and explain to you the difference between religious right, rights and what God expects. They just tell them the right thing. So, explanation of conditions. The internal reversal. Then Peter said unto them, repent. The word uh, repent, the Greek word is metanoieo. Meta is that word for change, and noieo is, is to know or to have a mind about something, to have a, a way of thinking about something. Uh, the uh, nous, N-O-U-S, we would spell it in English, is the word for the mind. And so we say, did you change your mind? Well, this is changing the mind, but it means to change the mind into something else. You're not happy with the mind you have, so you're changing the mind, you see. And that's what repent is. So it refers not to feeling sorry for sin. Now, it, that's what you do because you are happy in your sin. You are happy to, to continue in your sin. When you repent, you change that. It's a reversal of thinking. It's a whole new way of thinking. And that's it. When Christ said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he was saying, you're thinking about it in the wrong way. Repent. Change the way you're thinking about it. And then he would explain to them how they were to think about it. All right. Um, so, the second, the external recognition, he says, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Now they knew what baptism was. It was stepping down into a, a pond or, or a, a place that they dug out for it. And the Jews had different reasons for doing different things. <clears throat> but uh, when John the Baptist was preaching, he wanted them to come into the river. He would put them under the water, bring them back up. And that was um, repentance for their sins, to think differently. This was to this was conversion to, to uh, take on a different way of life. Instead of doing what you want when you want it, doing it because you like it, to change the way you think and to do what God says and to do it because God wants it, because it's pleasing God, not you. And uh, that was uh, baptism for repentance of sin. This, then, is to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, under his, putting yourself under his authority by this baptism. So it's a different baptism than it was ever done. This is Christian baptism, not uh, any other kind. So you, you may have been baptized when you were young. You may have been baptized before you got saved. But uh, this is Christian baptism where after you're saved, you are baptized into the name of Christ, saying, I identify with Christ. I, I am immersed into him. Now, I'm going to spend some time on this verse because this is the verse, the go-to verse, for those who say you have to be baptized to be saved. And they say, you see what it says here, that you are baptized for the remission of sin, you see. And sure enough, it does. However, that's not going deeply enough. Uh, if we, you and I were Greek-speaking people and read this in the Greek, uh, that Greek, the Koine Greek, 
we would understand something. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The word in is the Greek word epi, E-P-I. Um, and it means uh, upon. Something is upon. We've talked before about the idea of having knowledge, gnosko, and then having epignosko. I remember Brother Jeb Porter was saying to, uh, to know uh, about uh, animal disease would be gnosko. Having what Dr. Kopp has would be epignosko. This is knowledge on top of knowledge. This is graduate school stuff. So uh, this is then uh, to be baptized upon the name. This is you putting yourself on the name of that. So he commands them to be baptized upon the name of Jesus Christ. Now that means in, um, uh, in their confession of faith. I confess my faith by believing in Christ, and upon that confession I am baptized. So that's the idea of it. And then for remission of sin, the word for is the Greek eis, E-I-S, meaning into. And uh, you, you see there's in, it means we are in the room. But somebody opens the door or comes in with an open door, they are moving into the room. You see the difference? We are already in, we are surrounded by something, but into is the transition of going into. So you are going into the sphere of remission. Um, you are, the, the baptism uh, allows you to enter the, uh, enter to the concept or with reference to remission. Remission means, to remit is to, to take away. It means release from bondage, figuratively uh, uh, or, or literally. If you were in bondage to have that remitted, it would be to take off the, cuff, the uh, cufflinks, the uh, handcuffs. Um, but figuratively, forgiveness of sins, because sin is also a bondage. All right. Now, this usage, this Greek usage, into and upon, is used of the tasteless salt. Christ asks, we, we are to be salt of the earth. Salt doesn't cure, but salt prevents the spread of. There's, there's an idea. Let's pack the cattle in salt. And they won't get the disease. They won't like it much, but... Uh, Anyway, but anyway, the, the idea here is that uh, so that's why they do salt meat is to prevent it from going bad. And um, so the salt, if, you, if the salt loses its taste, Christ says, what, and we're supposed to be the one that makes the world taste better, not Willy Wonka, but we Christians, to make the world taste good, uh, to, to sense that what we're doing makes it better and to prevent the spread of sinful disease. So the point is this, that um, he says, if the salt loses its taste, what are you going to do with it? Salt it? You know, you're going to take good salt to salt the tasteless salt? That's a waste of, waste of energy, waste of time. So he says, no, it's only good to be thrown out. So now, looking back at this, it is neither it, the tasteless salt, is neither fit for into the land, nor yet for into the dunghill. So uh, it carries the meaning with reference to. It is not improve the land, does not improve even the dunghill, uh, where the animal's uh, feces is piled. We use the same idea in English then, when we say, take aspirin for your headache. Now, somebody that doesn't know English very well might say, do you mean take aspirin to get a headache? No, no, no. We don't want to get a headache. We have a headache, but we'll take it in reference. We'll take the aspirin in reference to the headache, you see. Uh, that will help. So that's what it means. Peter did not mean, and here's my conclusion, did not mean be baptized to get forgiveness of sins, but be baptized in reference to the fact that you have been, your sin has been remitted. All right.
So that time is to say that if you can actually study it in the original language, you will get the idea that that's not what it's saying. You don't get saved. You don't get saved by being baptized. You don't get baptized to get saved. That's a physical work. That's a ritual rite and um, a religious ritual. So, uh, and it's not by works of righteousness, which baptism would be a work of righteousness, but you're not saved by works of righteousness that we have done. All right, moving on then, the external reward, he says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, it has a, really a twofold meaning. One is, this is receiving the Holy Spirit himself, which comes as a gift, a gift of salvation. And do understand that this is not just symbolic. This is the actual person of the triunity, God the Holy Spirit, has that ability to be everywhere. And so in a special way, he comes to live within the believer's heart. He does not live in the heart of every person, even though technically he has a presence there. Um, he's not doing the work that he's doing in them that he does in the believer. So it is the gift of the Holy Spirit himself but probably also, uh, and, and certainly in, in the context of what's going on, the Holy Spirit came upon these disciples, and what happened? He gave them a gift of speaking in tongues, this ability to speak a foreign language without knowing the foreign language. So it probably here means the gift of speaking in tongues as well. And that was pretty much, this is why this is not a commandment to us, uh, get saved so you can speak in tongues. Um, it was something that was happening at that time and for the special reason to confirm to these Jewish people who for thousands of years have believed one way, now the Messiah has come, things have changed, and uh, so, and, and God is saying this is real and this is miraculous. All right, the exposition then is clarified. He goes on to say, all of this is happening, grace to the Jews, for the promise is unto you. He is speaking to Israel, speaking in Israel to the Israelites. And then grace to the children and to your children. He's saying, this is something that you can understand and pass on to your children. Go home, bring them to Christ. And then he goes even further, and that is grace to the Gentiles and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so the call goes out as the missionary outreach goes out. Now God is going to prompt the missionary outreach by persecution. We'll be getting into that in this lesson, or starting into that section. All right, so then the exhortation is continued in point D. It was clarified, now it's continued. And with many other words did he, you know, preachers, many other words. You, you know how that works. He did testify and exhort, two things, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now, save yourself doesn't mean you can get saved by doing it yourself. He means run for help. Flee to the cross of Christ, you see. This word testify is Strong's 1263, dia mai. Martyr is the Greek for witness. So they took that word when people were being killed for the Lord because that was a witness. But this is dia through, and it means to solemnly confirm. Um, so they were testifying, and they were very, very uh, solemnly confirming these truths. Then the word exhort is a word that we've become familiar with. It is a para kaleo, para alongside kaleo, to call. And it means to call alongside, to, and in the uh, uh, imperfect tense, kept exhorting, kept encouraging, kept comforting. The word carries all three meanings. So we're upset. What do we do? We're under conviction of sin. Comforting them, he tells them how to get saved. Encouraging them. Don't be discouraged. 
God has an answer, and in exhorting, don't wait, and don't wait to share this with your family. Now, this untoward generation, untoward is Strong's 3870, uh, para, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, is uh, 4646, scolios. If you heard of people with uh, scoliosis, uh, the person back in the day when the saw that people had back, uh, the spine was beginning to twist in places, not supposed to twist. Uh, Pastor uh, Daryl Moore and um, Kathy, the daughter, Natalie, um, had uh, scoliosis. They had to go in and actually put metal rods and I don't know, wire, uh, wire the spine to that to make it straight. And it's worked uh, for her. But scoliosis, and it means crooked. They just took the word for crooked. So it was used here to mean perverse or wicked. Like we say, the guy was a crook. The guy was crooked. Um, perverse or wicked. And um, uh, what? A, a generation. For us, a generation is kind of a process of parents having children or children having grandchildren and so on, moving a generation. But it literally means men of the same family. This is... This is the word for a tribe, uh, for um, a family that grows, and, but they're all of the same family. So in this case, it's referring to the Jewish nation. I believe that's the same as in Philippians 2.15, which I'll leave for you to look it up when you uh, care to. But uh, generation, they're referring to, uh, to the Jewish nation. So he's saying, flee from this nation of ours that has become sinful, sinful enough to meet the Messiah and say, away with him, have him killed. Now, because of this, there was the result of spiritual believers. The apostles had no ability to save people. Christ alone can save. And the process can be presented and offered, but it has to be received. So we see spiritual believers, membership added, the positive reception, then they that gladly received his word, we see this is an, this is an acceptance. This is a receiving, a welcoming of that news. Positive reception, public recognition, were baptized, they said, I'm, I'm for it, I believe. Personal responsibility, and the same day. All of this happens in that day. Preserving records were added unto them about 3,000 souls. We've gotten away from the idea of keeping records, you know, and all this stuff. So uh, they say, oh, it's just, it's just spiritual. You just come and have a fellowship and leave and so on. But it wasn't so. The pattern that God established, they took names and they said they got baptized on this day. Then the main activity, what were they doing? And here, we, if we are interested in imitating or fulfilling the pattern that God established for this church, for church, we would see what they did. Well, first of all, they were submitting, and they continued steadfastly. Steadfastly for us just means staying, staying with the stuff. But uh, this word, <clears throat> steadfastly, means to be consistently attentive unto, paying close attention, and to give unremitting care to a thing. Unremitting means not giving up on it, staying with it. So they were focused on the, um, what they were hearing. Then the, the, uh, submitting was part of it. They said, I need this, I want this. And then shepherding in the apostles' doctrine. Doctrine is the word for teaching. So they were giving special care to what the apostles taught them, submitting to the shepherding. The society and fellowship, uh, some of these people perhaps didn't know each other very well, but they became brothers and sisters in Christ. And so they began to have fellowship. And then supping, I'm searching for S words, uh, and in breaking of bread, but also supplicating and in prayers. 
Then, as a result of this and God working in them, there were signs. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. God uses these terms to speak of the miracles that were being done because they were wonders and signs. Wonders means they were amazing. The people were amazed. And the sign means, and they meant something. It was, it was something that pointed to another truth. And I think that Luke, the historian here, seems to use the word fear, which is uh, Strong's 5401 phobos. A phobia, all these phobia things, this is where we get the word fear. <clears throat> and I think here it means to represent that sense of fearful awe that the supernatural inspires in men. Uh, we see on TV that something supernatural is happening. People go, oh boy, that's interesting. You know, that's not the way it works. People are going, what? See, natural, we say that's natural. That's normal. Supernatural, hey, things aren't supposed to do that. It's like the feeling I had when I was in an earthquake and then solid earth was going, hey. <laughs> and, and it's like, this isn't supposed to happen like this, you know. We were at the old uh, church building downstairs in, in the solid basement and the, the, uh, the metal chairs set up along the tables there started dancing around, hitting together. What's going on here? And it, it's, that's not right, you know. But um, it's it, fear. I mean, if, if you're walking by a plant and the rose goes, hey, how are you doing? You, you're not going to say, how cute. You're going, ah, and you just run away. So fear. Uh, people were noticing with those Christians, they do miracles, you know. That's, that's a little scary. Not only signs, but they were sharing, and all that believed were together and had all things common. Now this is looking well ahead, because right now, the thousands were saved, um, but they were selling and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And um, so uh, 3,000 people got saved and began having church. Now, they didn't have a building. Uh, they met in areas. They would go into the temple area. They often did that. Um, then smaller groups would meet together in other people's homes and that type of thing uh, to, to do this, the fellowship, the uh, Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread and so on. Uh, they would have to be someplace where you could get bread and sit down and eat it and so on. Then maturing attitudes, purpose, and they continuing daily with one accord. One accord means with one mind, like in Romans 5, 6, 15, 6, as we, you see the verse there. Uh, the place was both public in the temple and private, breaking bread from house to house. And so he said, yeah, hey, all 3,000 of you come over to my house. They're probably not. Uh, this was smaller groups. And then provision did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. This word meat, we, you know, we say, well, this is bread, this is meat, that's something else, chicken or beef. Um, but this word meat is just general for food, trophy. Uh, food or nourishment, not just strictly meat. So praise, they were praising God, and peace, having favor with all people. This word favor is the, actually the usual word for grace, charis. My granddaughter's name is Charis. Uh, they didn't choose it from this, it's just nice coincidence. But at this time, snapshot picture of the church, uh, the people outside the church said, well, they're a little different, but they're okay. So they were friendly with the church. Then progress, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And people have pointed to this and say, see, some of them should get saved, some of them shouldn't get saved. That's not what it's saying. It means that they were being saved, not that they ought to be saved. And this is the first uh, use of the word church, ecclesia, those who have been called out, but called out of their homes to be gathered together. Uh, so that was the starting of the church. Let me uh, just finish quickly here to say that uh, the starting of the church, there was a starting of persecution now. We see there was a miracle at 
prayer time. And this is uh, interesting. There was at least 30 miracles described in the book of Acts. Bishop Trench took the number of miracles in the Gospels as 32. So it's an interesting comparison between these two periods of biblical history. Now, most of the miracles are public in character and of great variety. We'll be seeing it as we go. But the scripture connects miracles to the mediatorial kingdom, which culminates in the millennial kingdom when Christ returns to earth. And this is because uh, this is the kingdom connection is that the uh, kingdom was being offered to Israel. We've mentioned this before, so I don't need to go through it. Now we see the minister's route. Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. That would be 3 p.m. And you see how the early church members were not Gentiles. They were Jews, and the Jews went to temple at the time of prayer, if they were in the area. And so they continued being Jews. There was nothing wrong with worshiping Jehovah as a Jew. Then there was a man's routine that was along this way. He was crippled from birth, certain man lame from his mother's womb. <clears throat> he had never walked. I want you to, to look at this poor guy's legs. He's 40 years old. He's been this way 40 years. And he's never walked. What does his legs look like? They're spaghetti with a knot tied in the middle. You know, it's just little legs. And carried from home. He was carried. The word carried is in the imperfect tense. They kept carrying him to this place where he could ask for alms. He had that cardboard sign. Can't walk. Please help and then crying for help, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered un into the temple. So uh, I mentioned this word ask is used <coughs> and translated in all these different ways. <coughs> so this wasn't just, could I, could I have some money, please? This was begging, requiring, calling for, please help, please help. Let me drop on down because it says the place, the, the gate called Beautiful. Uh, I, I need to take this time to read this to you because uh, this is going back to this time. Josephus was Joseph who uh, became the historian for the Romans. So he took the Roman ending, uh, Josephus, in his Wars of the Jews history. Uh, he describes this. Now nine of these gates around uh, the temple were on every side covered over with gold and silver as were the jams of their doors and their lintels. So picture this now. This is a great gate that is opened up for uh, caravans to come through and that type of thing. And it's covered with gold and silver. But there was one gate that was without the inward court of the uh, holy house. This is a little further outside, which was of Corinthian brass and greatly excelled those that were only covered with silver and gold. Each gate had two doors whose height was severally 30 cubits. 45 feet. 40 feet is about four stories. So four and a half stories high is a gate that opens up like this and beautifully done in Corinthian brass. Um, had on each side rooms and those both in breadth and length built like towers. Their height was above 40 cubits, over 60 feet. Two pillars did also support these rooms and were in circumference 12 cubits. So that's 18 feet around. I did the math, and that makes a pillar about six feet diameter. Um, now, the magnitudes of the other gates were equal one to another, but that over the Corinthian gate, which opened on the east over against the gate of the Holy House itself, was much larger for its, heart was, its height was 50 cubits, 75. This is moving up to an eight-story building that you're looking at just as a gate. And we're 40 cubits, 60 feet. Uh, doors were 60 feet. So, and uh, it was adorned after a most costly manner as having much richer and thicker plates of silver and gold upon them than the other. So Corinthian brass and then decorated with silver and gold. So uh, it was a great place to be and it was also a good time. Uh, he put him there in time for the people that were coming by going to prayer at the temple. If you're going to find compassionate hearts, surely that's when you're going to find it. So he was carried.
to the gate of the temple in time to beg from the faithful who came at the hour of prayer. All right, next week's memory verse is Acts 2.41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Acts 2.41. Comments or questions? All right, great. Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed with prayer. Father, you've given us an opportunity to turn our hearts to thee by looking at how you structured the first church. When the church began, when they 3,000 people got saved and the disciples said, what are we going to do with this? Uh, we, we have to teach them. We have to encourage them. We have to share with them the Last Supper that Christ told us to, to keep doing as long as we uh, remember him until he returns. We pray, Father, that you might help us to see that we are safe if we take our pattern from them. This is how you began. This is not how men twisted it later. Uh, this is the purity of the original church. We ask you, you might give us that wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.